Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. Now I'm going to take a break on this rotary table series for a video or two, but I got to throw my hat in the ring on the subject of chucks for your lathe. Now I've seen a lot of comments out there where guys say the only chuck that you need is a four jaw chuck, and uh, you know I can do anything with a four jaw you can do with any other chuck, and that's probably absolutely correct. A four jaw chuck, in my opinion, if you had one check to write and you wanted to buy one chuck and you wanted it to be the most versatile chuck because you don't have a whole lot of money and you don't want to buy 10 chucks, then I would say a four jaw chuck is the way to go because yes you can hold square stuff, you can hold rectangular, you can hold oblong, you can hold round stock, you can make it concentric, eccentric, whatever. So yes a four jaw chuck could be a good choice. Is it the best choice? Yeah, you know, I'm really not a fan, i got to say. I think the optimum choice would be a three-jaw chuck, and there's a reason for this. The only object that will never be out of balance when you place it down on an irregular surface is a three-point object. That's why tripods will always sit still no matter what. You could put it on a rock, you could put it on a shelf, you could put it on a flat, you could put it on a, a anything. A three-point object will always be stable. Now this being said, three points of contact in a chuck configuration will always hold whatever it is you're holding. Is it optimum? It, I don't know. It will always hold it, but here's the downside to a three-jaw chuck. And there's not too many downsides to a three-jaw chuck. They're really handy and that's pretty much all I use. I'd love to have a six-jaw, but that has its limits as well, although they are beautiful. If you have a spare one laying around you want to send it in, I'll give you the address. All right, chucks, three jaw. Three jaw is good, but it is 120 degrees between contact points. What does this do? This increases the potential for a triangular distortion on the part that you do. If you squeeze your part like you just think you're going to tow an ocean liner with it and you bore it and the hole's nice and round, and when you release it, gee, the plug gauge doesn't fit anymore because you triangulated it, you squeezed it heavy on three points, bored a nice round hole in it, and when you opened it up, those three points relaxed, and now they're the high spots. If you were to put the indicator in, it's going to go bounce around. You're going to go, I don't know what happened. It was good in the machine. Well, you over torqued it. Three points of contact did that to you. Will you get that with a six jaw? You will have a lot less aggravation with a six jaw than you will with a three jaw, but Anything you put in a six jaw, it better be round because when a six jaw comes down on it, 60 degree contact points, fantastic grip, going to reduce the chatter, going to reduce the noise, super strength. But if it's not round, when you squeeze it in a six jaw, it's going to make it round. Same thing's going to happen like over torquing a three jaw chuck. When you relax it, boing, it's going to go back to whatever it was before the six jaws got after it and now all of a sudden your plug gauge doesn't fit or your feature's not round anymore. So six jaw is the optimum in my choice and I made myself a list here so I can keep track of what I'm telling you. So bear with me while I check these things off. Six jaw chucks, low. Very conditional based on the parts that you put in them being round because there is nothing worse than squeezing a part in a six jaw chuck and hearing that knock, 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 knock when you turn the machine on because you have a jaw or two bouncing around that aren't touching the part. So six jaw chucks, fantastic. Make sure the work is round. All right, types of chucks. You can have adjustable chucks, which means you squeeze your part and then you dial in a bunch of screws around the outside, which brings it in, which is an adjustable floating, adjust true. There are many different brand names, but you can dial in the concentricity. Let's just assume on a scroll chuck, which has a continuous scroll and you turn one spot as the scroll turns, all three jaws move at the same time. For sake of this presentation, let's pretend that we have chucks that have some degree of integrity. Let's just assume that. A couple of that. You can have a non-adjustable chuck. Non-adjustable chucks, I see a lot of projects where guys bore out the back of their existing chucks, make a plate that has a, a boss on it and screws that hit that boss and mount it and they can then float their chuck on that. That's, that's an ideal way to do it if the configuration of your chuck allows you to do that machine work. By all means, have at it. But it's one of those deals where if you try to do that, you need a chuck to hold the chuck while you're modifying the chuck, and it's like, oh, hey, I need two chucks all of a sudden. So if you have two, great. If not, do it on a rotary table. 
All right, so you have an adjustable, non-adjustable, and an independent would be, uh, independent jaw chuck would be a, a prime example of four jaw, where each jaw has its own driving screw. Simple. My opinion, the ideal chuck to have is an adjustable body chuck, where once you torque down on it, you can then dial in the concentricity. Get Types of chucks that I've seen over my professional career, I've seen two jaw chucks, they're pretty cool. I've seen independent jaw, two jaw chucks, and I've seen scroll two jaw chucks where it just comes in like a vice. It looks like a spinning vice. I don't know where they came from, but one of the companies I used to work at had a bunch of them, and they were very handy, especially when you want to put in a fixture plate or something on either side, and you're going to hold something that's very irregular. A two jaw chuck works very well for that. Three jaw chuck, like I said before, will hold anything that you put in it, round or not. Uh, a lot of guys say, well, I can do anything with a four jaw, you can do with a three jaw. I disagree. You may be able to. Is it efficient? Is it, is it practical? Is it functional? Eh, not, not going to guarantee that. Then the argument will be, and I'm going to get up on the board here for a second. I'm going to show you why. Let's say we have four jaws on this round part. Now if you run a lathe with a four jaw chuck on it, chances are you've either colored your jaws or marked your jaws in such a way that you know which jaw you're looking at at any given time. I personally have mine labeled X, X1, Y, Y1, or Y prime. So I know exactly which jaw I am moving at any given time. If you plan to say, Okay, I have a bunch of round pieces I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it just as fast as you can in a three or a six jaw. And here's the secret. We are going to leave this one alone. We're going to leave this one alone, and we're only going to unlock X and Y each time we change a part. Will that work? Yeah. Is it conditional? Yes, it is conditional. It's conditional based on the fact that this diameter doesn't change because you have these registration points here and here, as this diameter increases or decreases based on the cart of parts you got from the first ship guy that used the tolerances because he wasn't paying attention, this radius falls away from center. It will fall this way or it will migrate this way. So whatever you're doing to this, if you're boring holes in it, if you're turning a journal on it, it's going to be eccentric to the OD as the OD changes with this four jaw method when you only use two jaws. If you're going to check it or indicate it each time, it's fine. You've got nothing to worry about. But a three jaw or a six jaw chuck, because it comes in concentric, it will maintain the center line of different diameter parts. This is a fact. Four jaw chucks are good for holding square stock. As you can see, the configuration is ideal. It's good for holding rectangular parts. You can put a center drill in your part in the middle, find your location, lock your part down on a four jaw chuck and just shift it around until that runs true, check it with an indicator, in you go. That's ideal. So let's talk the X prime, Y prime, covered that, three jaw chuck. Now three jaw can be as handy as it is dangerous. I've run a three jaw chuck for many, many years and I can tell you that when you think you've got something tight, you got to make sure that you're thinking ahead of the game or you might get yourself in a little trouble. Three jaw chuck. Every 120 degrees, there's contact point. That's pretty good. When you squeeze something in a three jaw chuck, now bear with me for just one second. I'll make sure we're still getting this because this is this is golden. Yipper. If you have an out of round condition or a low spot on the part that you are putting into a three jaw chuck and you don't realize it, the rotation of the part could find that low spot and that part could come out of the chuck. 
This is a fact. Take a piece of stock and put your anything, just take a piece of three inch diameter aluminum or whatever, put a flat on it, put it in your three jaw chuck. Rotate the, rotate the part as you're tightening up on the key. When that key, when that rotation of that part, the flat on that part aligns with one of the jaws, you're going to see the key go, whoop, you're going to get another half turn out of it or something or whatever. It's going to tighten down even farther. Yes, the part will at that point shift off center, but you have found the smallest three contact point grip for that part that you're going to, that you're going to find. This is good for forgings, castings, tubing, uh, a variety of other parts that you're going to want to hold. If you're not sure that it's round, it may look round, but if you're not sure that it's round, spin it and, and play with the key. Try it. It's a great technique. It's a solid technique, and it's exceptional technique for tubing. If you're trying to true up tubing, and you put it in there, and you're across the egg-shaped high spot of a tube, and you come down, you may influence that tube to the round three-point contact and come up with a feature that you really weren't hoping to get. So in a light contact for tubing work, rotate it until you find the smallest three-point contact you can find. It's a safer way and it'll give you a much better feature. Guarantee it. All right, soft jaws. Let's talk about soft jaws. You have a part that for cosmetic purposes, and forgive me for being long-winded here, but there's more to this than I thought there would be, so I kind of kind of like what I'm calling here. Soft jaws. When you bore soft jaws, use a piece of scrap metal, piece of a gauge pin. I know my guy, some foreman's throwing his clipboard against the wall, I never use a gauge pin in a chuck. I do it, but if I'm using aluminum jaws and I have a hardened steel gauge pin in there, chances are you're not going to damage the gauge pin. I don't endorse squeezing gauges in, in machines because that's just a not a good thing to do. But in a pinch, you know, don't like to see it done, but it'll work. Spiders are the best for boring jaws. Get yourself a piece of thick wall tubing. Put three holes in at 120 degrees, thread those holes, and then you have adjustable legs, and then just keep a bunch of different bolts and set screws around, and you can have a variety of different diameters from two or three pieces of steel and a half a dozen screws. Spiders are the way to go. And if you get slapped for using a cage pin, you didn't hear it here. All right, boring the jaws. The benefit behind boring the jaws is you have fantastic contact on the outside of your part. You're not going to leave teeth marks in it. You're going to support it better, but when you bore your jaws, I see a lot of guys boring their jaws. They've got their spider mechanism or pin or scrap stock closer to the body of the chuck. You know, if you're going to bore a jaw and you're only going to go a half inch deep, whatever you're using to spread those jaws and maintain the pressure, well, keep that just shy or or a little extra of the depth that your final jaw feature is going to be. 500 deep jaws, keep this thing around 600. You don't want it all the way back by the chuck. You want the load, the preload on those jaws to be basically where the final load is going to be when you're using those jaws. Stay tight. Stay tight to the feature. When you do your jaw, do not bore those jaws until the part slips in. What have you done? <laughs> what have you done? Okay, well what you've done is you've put a larger radius in your soft jaw than the size of your part. So what, you might say. Well, I'm gonna, I'll show you so what. This is exaggerated, horribly exaggerated, but when you have a large radius holding a small radius, what do you got? you got point contact. you got tangent point contact. You've completely thrown the whole benefit of a soft jaw out the window because, ooh, it fits. Don't do that. You want a smaller or identical radius on your soft jaws than the part. 
because quite the opposite then takes place. Now, grossly exaggerated, of course, but this is what you're looking at. All right, got it. Now what do you got? You got two points of contact. So when you look around the perimeter of that part, you've got six points of contact. 120 degree jaws give you 60 degree contact points. Can't get any better than that. Ideal congruent, identical contact. Chances are it's not going to happen. It may, but when I bore jaws, I bore with a spider in the jaw. Here's your piece of pipe. Yeah, piece of tape. That's ugly, eh? There's your piece of pipe. You got your set screws in your jaws. You're going to bore your jaws. The part just slips in. It's like, okay, we'll look at the reading on your bar, or excuse me, on your dials, because it's just like any other boring operation, there's going to be a setting or reading on your dial. If you know what reading it was that allowed that part to go in, record it. That's where you don't want to go. You want to stay a couple thou away from that now. Open your jaws, take one or two, it doesn't really matter, one works just fine. This does not have to run concentric for boring soft jaws. Dial it in a half a turn and close. Close the jaws. That diameter is now smaller than it was before because the grip points of the spider make a smaller triangle. The jaws just closed up. Let's say you stopped at 150. You don't stop at 150 this time. If you're coming back, stop at 152 or 148, however you're reading your dial. Now you got away from that single point contact and you have this. Your part may not fit ideally or slop around with the jaws clamped shut, but when you take that spider out and put that part in, you got money right there. By all means, once you've established a soft jaw pocket in a three jaw chuck, four, six, whatever, check the first part. Dial it in if you can dial it in. If it looks like it's running out, rotate it, check it again. All right, so we got the spider, plus and minus on the bore. I'll show you my spiders. I've got two. I've only used two in the last 40 years and never let me down. So let's move on to types of jaws. You have reversible jaws, you have master carrier jaws, you have two piece jaws, you have soft jaws. How do you know what kind of jaw you have? Well, if you have a jaw that doesn't have screws in the front, it's a solid jaw, it's a hard jaw. Can you use a soft jaw setup with that? Nope. You have to have a jaw that has two screws in the face of it so you can remove the top. That carrier that stays with the chuck, the jaw comes off, reverses, goes back on, and screw that down. That's what you take off, use the screws and put your soft jaw on that bottom carrier. That's great. I've also seen chucks that have ID gripping jaws and OD gripping jaws, solid. You need six jaws. Yeah, you also need a carrier jaw if you ever plan to use soft jaws, so that's that. This shop does not have a six jaw chuck. I have a couple of chucks for my lathe, and you've seen my lathe. It's a 1340 Clausing Colchester, also known in the UK as a Triumph 2000, I believe. Great machine, love it. Colchester closing lathes are fantastic, love them. Uh, different shapes you can hold. I think I went over the egg shape. You want to rotate something until you've got the smallest contact points available. Squares, torque. Let's talk about torque. It's a great thing to talk about. Now we're looking at the top of the machine, okay? Top of the chuck. Here's your chuck body. Machine. Now let's talk about a little different kind of distortion. Instead of the 3.4 point, 6 point, whatever bore high spot distortion that I mentioned before, let's talk about face distortion. 
when you squeeze a part in a chuck, we're looking down on top of the machine now. You've got your thin parts. This is predominantly present on thinner material. Got a nice plate you want to hold it at. Life is good, right? As soon as you squeeze that, it's going to go one way or the other because that material's got to go somewhere. It's either going to bulge out or it's going to bulge in. So let's just assume it bulges out. What happens? Well, it bulges out, right? Grossly exaggerated. Here's your part. It's just bulged out because you're squeezing it like there's no tomorrow. There's no reason to over torque the parts that you put in a lathe. Torque it tight enough to hold it, give it a little snug, you're good. If you have a big chuck with big jaws, make sure that once you fire up the machine, if you have an excessive RPM on that chuck, something's going to relax. Those jaws are going to want to pinwheel out or centrifugal force is going to want to take a little bit of the load off. So make sure that the load or the torque that you put on your part is adequate to hold the part without damaging the part. Bigger chucks are more affected by RPM than smaller chucks. But nonetheless, you don't want a part coming out of any chuck. I've had it happen and it'll, it'll scare you. It really will scare you. Good reason not to stand in line with the spinning part. Anyway, when you cut this part and you put a nice chop on this, here's your cut. When that part is no longer under pressure and it relaxes, what do you have? You have a dish. It used to be flat, but now it's going to translate. So the one side's going to look like this. Back side's going to be flat. Because when this relaxes, it looks like this. You've lost your cross section. It's not what you think, and it's not flat anymore. You have a nice indicator reading across it while it was in the machine. You're all proud of yourself. You put it on the bench, and then the whole lot comes back from inspection because it's caved in. See what happened? It torqued it too hard. This will happen in a, in a fashion with a three-jaw chuck that you will not believe. Some corners will go in, some will pop out, the center will bulge, and when you're done with it, you put the indicator on it, and it looks like, I don't know, it just goes, you can't, there's no rhyme or reason to exactly what's going on with that indicator when you run the indicator across it, because there's no, there's, there's no constant. Some are down, some are up, some are dished, some are bulged. It'll make you nuts. Do not squeeze it too tight. If you have thin material, the more surface contact you have behind that material, the better. Would a six jaw be better than a three jaw with thin material? Yes, it would. Would nice, wide, soft jaws be well received? Yes, they would. So think about it. If the part's screaming at you, if it's making all kinds of noise, it's because it's vibrating. So listen to the material as you're cutting it because it's talking to you. It's telling you what's going on. So pay attention. Right, I'm going to take a short walk out to the shop. I'm going to show you the chucks that I have. I'm going to show you the jaws that I have and the spiders that I use to bore those jaws. And that may or may not be the end of the video out there, but we'll find out. Let's take a walk out to the bench. Take a look. This is my three jaw. It's a buck 10 inch adjust true chuck. And let me slip it out of gear here so we can spin it. Now you'll know if the chuck is adjustable if you have these adjustment screws along the perimeter of your part, or excuse me, along the perimeter of your chuck. I have four screws, one every 90 degrees, and this particular chuck only has one key engagement. It is a scroll chuck, so for one spin of the key, all the jaws move at the same time. And you can see the holes that I've put in it over the years for my standoffs and my stops. They work exceptionally well, and I wouldn't have it any other way. This is a two-piece jaw. For the hard jaws that go on here, they can be mounted for OD work, flip for ID work, and comes in quite handy. Also the foundation for soft jaws. Soft jaws are, there you go, aluminum, off you go. You will notice that these jaws are labeled 1, 2, and 3. If you take your jaws out, it is not important to put these jaws back in the slot with the same number. It is not. It is a good rule of thumb, yes, because the jaw is marked and the slot is marked. 
two, two, three, three. The one thing that is very important is the sequence. One, two, three. You can put these in any rotation you want to in any slot so long as the sequence is the same. You could put jaw number one in slot number three so long as the next one is two and the one after that is three. If it's not, God only knows what kind of holding arrangement you're going to have, but it's the relationship from jaw to jaw that's important, not the particular slot. The chuck has no clue what slot that is, but those numbers are on those slots for reference only. Now one of the things that I've done over the years with every chuck I have ever had, and I'm going to zoom in, I hope it's, there it is. This was visible on one of my other videos, and I think it's worthy to point it back out. The leading beveled edge of this jaw, this would be jaw number three, because when you install your jaws, you install jaw number one first, jaw number two, and then jaw number three. So that only goes to show that as they come out, they come out in that order. Jaw number three would be the first one to come out. As the beveled edge of that jaw gets to that index mark right there, I know that I have two more turns of my chuck key before this jaw comes out. Let's try one. And this is the only time you're ever going to see me let go of a chuck key while I'm working. Still in, gonna go for probably another half a turn. There's a half. Still in. Two. Two and a quarter. Ah, we're getting pushy here. Two and a half. Out it comes. Okay, so I've given myself about an eighth of an inch of grip before this jaw launches. I am not sure where that compressor kicked in and what it interrupted, but like I was saying, I've given myself about a tooth and a half to two teeth worth of engagement because I just don't think it's a good idea to torque down on a hard jaw with any less than that. Once you've reinstalled carrier jaws in your chuck, spin them down until it's true to the outside. Give the chuck a spin. Make sure everybody else is in the same seat. If you're in, then you're good. If they're all, all in the same spot, it's golden. It's time to run it. All right, if you do not have one of those marks on the face of your chuck, put that mark on the face of your chuck. And as far as the soft jaws are concerned, let's bounce over to the spiders for a second. These are the spiders that I use. Simple piece of thick wall tubing. Drilled and tapped 120 degrees, and you can see if you're going to use set screws in this, you can hold down to two inches or put the bolts in and expand it up to six or eight. And then you have its little buddy here, which can go down even further. So these are the only two spiders I have in my box, and I've never been at a loss to bore soft jaws. Some shops you'll see will have a thing called a Christmas tree, and that is a bunch of uh, plates, quarter inch, eighth inch, whatever that range in diameter and when you stack them they look like a Christmas tree and then when you get the Christmas tree you just pick the plate that works best for you. It's also a good thing to have but I found out that a couple of bolts and a few of these guys right here and you don't need a 12 pound aluminum Christmas tree. So if you don't have a spider make a spider. Four jaw chuck I have is also a 10 inch. It's small these are solid jaws. This is an independent scroll because each one has its own. And there's the X prime, or X2, that I mentioned. Each key has its own, or each jaw has its own key slot. So they move independently, and you can take these out and spin them around backwards so you can hold a variety of rectangular and square shapes in that as well. Let's take a look at the congruency of a soft jaw. And I lost the spider. There it is. You can see if the jaw is, is bigger, 
or excuse me, if the radius of the jaw is smaller than the part, that you'll get two points of contact. If the radius is bigger than the part, you'll get contact in the center and the part will have a tendency to want to roll. Let's go over this side. There you go. Just as I demonstrated on the board. Now if you're going to do this, here's a really good idea. If you do not have an adjustable spider, that once you've bored it, you can say, oh, I don't like the way it felt, so crank these in, squeeze again, rebore it. If you're going to use a solid plug, brass pipe, it doesn't matter. If you have a plug in between the three jaws that you're boring, instead of having to take this out and turn it down, leave a shim in here. Put a piece of cardboard or something else on one or more of the jaws. That way, if you overbore the jaw, you can open them up, take the shim out, close back down on the same plug, and you've just bought yourself some more material to bore out. Just don't re-bore it to the same setting that you had on the dials before. That's about it, guys. I was inspired to make this. I had a couple of uh, comments and seen a couple of things lately. And I hope that you got something out of this. If nothing else, if you take nothing else away from this, put that safety mark on your jaw, okay? It's always good to know when you're opening up really big and you're starting to say, gee, I wonder how much more room until these jaws fly out. You're going to know exactly how much more room. This is a great safety feature. I would highly recommend it. And it's been on every chuck I've ever worked on. That's it. That's all we got. I know this was long, and I hope you hung in. Thank you very much for watching. Joe Pye, out.